Okay, so here we are. Today, we are beginning a new book of the Chumash. We are in Parsha's Vayikra. And in Vayikra, God calls to us. The first word of the Parsha, of, of the Sedra, which is the first word of the whole book is, and he called. Now Rashi says, that God showed a unique love to Moshe and to his people in the beginning of Parshas Vayikra, when it says, and he called to Moshe and God spoke to him. In other words, it says, usually it says, and God spoke to Moshe or something like this. But here it says, and he called to Moshe. And then it says, and God spoke to him. So God spoke to him before speaking his message. And Rashi and other commentators say that the reason for this is to show him affection. And it even says, and he called, which means God himself in his essence called to Moshe just to show him affection. And that was to, to Moshe and to the whole people. So, So God didn't call Moshe to give information, but he called him to express the fundamental love that God shares with him and his people. Part of what fundamental means in this case is that it said, and he called. In other words, it's not a name of God, which means an expression of God. It means he himself called Moshe. And Although it was Moshe alone who was called, this call was addressed to him as the leader of our people as a whole, and therefore it's a call to each and every one of us. So our own inner godly nature, which we have, constantly calls to us, seeking to express itself. So it's like the soul of who we are, or Hashem himself who is in us is calling to us wanting to be expressed. So let's begin with a story. This is a story about one of the earlier Lubavitcher Rebbes, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the third Lubavitcher Rebbe who was called the Tzemach Tzedek. He was a grandchild of Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, the founder of Chabad. His mother died, in other words, the daughter of the Alter Rebbe died when he was a baby. And before her death, his grandfather promised that he would raise the child. So what does he do? The day after Yom Kippur in 1793, that's when the story took place, the Rebbe prepared his grandchild for his first day of learning. That day, the Rebbe asked the teacher to learn the first Torah portion of the book of Vayikra with his grandchild. It's very interesting that this particular portion that we are learning today is the portion that children begin to learn. So this is very essential, this Parsha and this story. And so what happened was on that day, and the, the Alter Rebbe told his teacher, when the teacher finish, would finish his lesson, the Rebbe told him to give the child honey cookies and a hard boiled egg on which various verses were written. I want to say that the last time I, people still do this, in Yiddish it's called an Arayn Firnish. I just went to an Arayn Firnish of a grandchild, perhaps a month ago, where they, the child is brought into Cheder. This is going to not, this is, be, this is the beginning of his learning. And the father brings him wrapped in a talit into the, into the school. Sounds a little bit like a safer Torah. And there he sits on the lap. We were there. It's not the first one I've been to him. He sat on the lap of the Rebbe who showed him Vayikra with his finger. And they asked him, do you see this letter? Do you see this letter? And he didn't know his letters. And then he brought out a honey cookie, but he also dripped honey onto a chart with the letters for the child to lick the honey so that Torah should be sweet and learning should be sweet. And then there's a hard boiled egg on which se several psukim, 
are written. And these he were giving. Right. So now after this, the young child then asked his Zaidi, his grandfather, who was the Alter Rebbe, why is the letter of Aleph of the word Vayikra written so small? So if you take a look at your Chumash, I happen to have a Chumash here, you will see that the letters of the word Vayikra are all what we call regular letters. They're all the same size. But the letter, the last letter of Vayikra with an Aleph, the Aleph is little. In other words, all the letters are average size letters and the Aleph is a little Aleph. So the young child asked his grandfather, why is the letter Aleph of the word Vayikra written so small? Because he noticed that the word Vayikra was written in average size letters, but that the last letter, which means of this word, and he called, was written with a small Aleph. So for a moment, the Rebbe concentrated deeply. What that means is that he was going to give a deep answer to his grandchild. And then he opened his eyes and said, Adam, meaning the first man, was made by God. And he was even wiser than the angels. But Adam was impressed <coughs> by the knowledge of his good qualities, and then he sinned. So if you remember, Adam was the first man. He could see from one end of the world to the other. He had all the qualities. He could see into each thing what to name them because he would see what they were made of. So his vision was huge vision. You can expect more to come of this vision. God willing, Mashiach will see who we are and he will, there's more to be said about that. We're getting close. It's gonna be happening soon. And so Adam was impressed by his knowledge and somehow through that being impressed by himself, he sinned. Moshe, though he was aware of the qualities that God had given him, did not become conceited. On the contrary, he humbly said to himself, another person, if he would have been given the opportunity to go up to heaven and talk to God personally, or someone who had been given a soul like mine, he knew that he had such a high soul, he would have accomplished a lot more. And then the Alter Rebbe explains, the letters of the Aleph Bey come in three sizes, large, medium, and small. Because of Adam, Adam was impressed with his own status as God's handiwork and his great qualities. In Chronicles, in the book of Chronicles, Adam's name is spelled with a large Aleph. Since Moshe was not impressed by his own greatness, but on the contrary, he was humbled by it, the Aleph is written small for him. So what we have is almost all of the Torah is written in average letters. Occasionally, there are large letters written. Occasionally, there are small letters written. Adam has in Chronicles a large Aleph for his name, Adam, and then regular letters. And Moshe has this word where his Aleph is written small. <clears throat> now, when do we use the large or the small? So the Torah script is written with both a small Aleph for Moshe and a large Aleph for Adam. So how do we reflect these in ourselves? The small Aleph reflects Moshe's humility even when he was given personal divine attention. This is it, we just heard that Hashem is calling Moshe out of love for him, out of connection to him. It says, and he called. That means he himself, God himself, was giving affection to Moshe. And at that moment, Moshe felt great humility. Conversely, we find that in Chronicles, Adam's name has this large Aleph because he knew that he had awareness and greatness. Now, awareness, we are all descendants of, of Aleph, of Aleph, of Adam, and we're spiritually also descendants of Moshe because Moshe is our teacher, our Rebbe who guides us. And so we are like the children of Moshe. And it says that we all have a spark of Moshe within ourselves. So awareness of a person's good qualities are good, but it shouldn't swell the ego like it did with Adam. Now, Moshe re rectified this error. He recognized the greatness, his own greatness, but more importantly, 
he recognized where it came from. Humility is an awareness of our talents connected to an acknowledgement of where they come from. So we are supposed to know that we have talents and know what they are, but we need to know where our talents come from. Whoever is good at anything, that's a gift that Hashem gave us. Oh, so you could say, we're working on developing that talent. Well, that's appropriate because Hashem gave it to us. He wants us to work on it so that we develop the talent that Hashem is giving us. Moshe was aware of his qualities, but he didn't take any credit for it. So how do we fix or the attitude of Adam? And the Alter Rebbe is saying that this has to do with the two Alephs. Now, Adam and Moshe were both great men and both were aware of their greatness. Adam was what's called in the Torah, the handiwork of God, which means that God was, made him out of the divine image. And his sense of himself as the crown of God's creation, which he was, led to his downfall. And when he understood this to mean, because he understood that he, he realized that he had the greatest knowledge, but so he did. But Moshe knew that all of God's creations, from everything that was created, he was the only one to whom God spoke face to face. He knew that it was to him and through him that God communicated his wisdom and will to the world. But rather than the inflated olive of Adam, this knowledge brought out in him the modest olive of Vayikra. Moshe felt diminished by his gifts humbled by the awesome responsibility of living up to them. Isn't that interesting? That Moshe felt, and the Rebbe once has said this more than once. There was a person who went into the Rebbe and he said, I, you know, I know that I'm so smart and I know that I learned so much Torah and I know that when I'm giving over Torah, people get it and so much. And, and I, I think maybe I should stop teaching. Maybe I should stop doing that. That's what the person said to the Rebbe because I'm feeling like I'm getting an ego over it. And the Rebbe said, you know what? Don't stop. But if you feel you have qualities that are so great, then you need to live up to that. To work harder on it, to make those qualities better, to live up to the gifts we have. And this goes for everybody. That's a specific story with a person, I know who the person is, who spoke to the Rebbe about how to live up to his qualities. But what it means is, that each of us should feel diminished by our good qualities. I remember also an Israeli beauty queen, she had one Miss Israel, uh, had went up to the Rebbe and she was going to be in the world pageant. And the Rebbe said to her, you should have both inner and outer beauty and you should have your inner beauty being the main one. And that should be your your purpose in the world, to shine inner beauty out into the world. So the Rebbe was saying, of course, thank God, God gave you a blessing to be beautiful. Don't make, let yourself become self-conscious over that. The opposite, let your inner beauty shine out even more because you have outer beauty. So we're hearing that what is said here is that whatever gifts we have should make us more humble and that we should use them, the qualities, even more. So being humble about our good qualities makes us utilize our qualities in a better way. So the Torah says itself, Moshe was the most humble man on the face of the earth, not despite, but because of his greatness. So although it's both necessary and, be, and good to be aware of our positive qualities, Adam allowed his self-esteem to degenerate into conceit. And this called his, caused his downfall. Now, Moshe rectified Adam's mistake. He recognized his greatness, but he remained humble. And he had this reasoning in his mind. I can't take any credit for any of my gifts or accomplishments since they're all God-given. Indeed, if another person would have been given my potentials, he would have accomplished more and climbed the higher heights than I have. 
He understood that true humility does not mean putting oneself down, but seeing the virtue in others. So we're all spiritual heirs of Adam and Moshe. And when we feel inadequate, we need to remember that we are atoms with big olives. And that's positive. We need to know. So we're not saying Adam was not good. We're just saying he didn't utilize his blessings with enough humility. But that doesn't mean we're not supposed to utilize our blessings. And there are times that people say, you know, they don't feel secure. I mean, everybody has been through this. People not feeling secure. I'm not beautiful enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not this enough. I'm not that enough. And when we feel that way, we're not supposed to go into that. That's not called humility. That's called putting ourselves down. That's not so good. And then we have to know that like we are atoms, every one of us is a descendant of Adam. And we have a big olive, a positive olive. What does it mean? We have what we need in order to accomplish our purpose. In order to stand up, we need to have enough strength to do what we're here to do. So when thoughts of who am I, like who am I anyway, stop us from our task, we need to remember that we're formed by God's own hands and are fully capable of caring for his garden like Adam was told to do. It means to take care of the world and do what we're here to do. At the same time, we need to remember that we each have a spark of Moshe in us and therefore make sure that our self-assurance does not develop into conceit. So if we remember the small Aleph, we too will merit to be called by God. And this revelation will provide us with the strength to answer God's call, bring ourselves and the world closer to him. So we're going to talk more about what does it mean that we are called by God. <clears throat> but whatever talents we have are part of what we're supposed to be using in the world. If we feel inadequate, it's time to remember that we're atoms with a big olive and we're formed by God, empowered by him to care for his creation. However, we must draw upon the spark of Moshe in us to, to avoid overconfidence and self-aggrandizement, but to remember who everything comes from. Now, we all have days where we feel we're doing well in life and other days when we feel low. Some days we feel like we're in a good flow. Things are going well. We're climbing up to even more positivity. Other times we feel stuck in a rut without much energy or initiative. So what are we supposed to do with this? Now, Vayikra begins with God calling Moshe. And God called to Moshe and God spoke to him out of the tent of meeting saying, now we're talking about the next words after Vayikra. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, a man who shall bring of you an offering to God. So a person who's got a person, Adam, who is going to bring of you an offering to God. Now the book of Vayikra, Leviticus, teaches the laws of sacrifices. So there are all kinds of offerings that we can give to God. Our energy and talents, our dispositions and thoughts, our words and deeds. Whatever we have, we can give them over to God. And these all create a kinder home for God in this world because we're making this world a home for God. And when the world is smiling at us and when we feel big and productive, it could be easier to feel connected to God. But what about during when it feels like life feels petty and there's drudgery and you have a lot of dishes to wash, when we're feeling unfulfilled or uninspiring, what then? We have to maintain our connection, finding an offering in times that are not so wonderful or we feel dull. And that is a great challenge. What can we offer to God when we're not feeling in such a good place? And perhaps that's when we need to remember Vayikra. God is calling to us. 
even in these small moments of, even in these moments of smallness and loneliness, and God is inviting us to bring our offering and to come close. That means that in every day and in every moment, God wants us to be connected. The fact is we are connected to God, but in our always, but in our own consciousness to make connection to God, to bring an offering and to come close. I remember that there was a woman, I mean, a woman that I know, and she went through a tragedy in her family suddenly on a Friday afternoon. And she talked about how hard it was for her to light Shabbos candles. It was a complete shock. And to say a blessing on Shabbos candles, she didn't feel like saying a blessing. But it was, it's, she struggled with that she wanted to do that, that she needed to do that, or didn't she? But she needed to show up the best that she could at that moment. So the question is, when a person, and we should never be tested, should never be tested, but sometimes just on a, what we call a normal day, when we feel that we haven't accomplished what was on our list for already a few days in a row, and we're not feeling so good, about that and about ourselves. What can we do? So an offering to Hashem, everybody's going to drink their whatever they drink in the morning to say that blessing first is an offering to Hashem. And that's why it is good to be able to say it with consciousness, to put ourselves into it, to say this is a, a bless, an offering to you, a, ble a, a praise to you. So this is something that we want to do and try to do. So how can we have a healthy self-image? Do we think of ourselves as being not enough? When somebody gives us a compliment, do we say, thank you? Or do we say, oh, come on, not really. Oh, come on. Do we put ourselves down? That means the person's not believing that it's true. Do we think of ourselves as not being enough? Do we put ourselves down? Do we criticize ourselves and give us negative self messages? That kind of self doubt does not help us to grow. And then there's other people in the world. So in other words, here we are trying to grow. So when somebody gives you a compliment, it's good to say, thank you, even if you don't feel that way. Somebody says to you, you look so beautiful and you think, come on, get over it. Better to say, thank you. This is good for us because we are thinking positively. Of course, if we really look good, where is that gift coming from? From Hashem. So instead of making it about us, we have to be grateful to Hashem. Then there's other people out there who think they don't need to grow at all. <laughs> and instead of seeing where they need to develop, they don't see any problem with themselves. They think they're perfect just as they are. So how can we come to a healthy and realistic self-image while we develop an active desire to improve? How do we properly assess our accomplishments and our shortcomings, avoiding big egos and low self-esteem? How do we get rid of the big ego and of the low self-esteem? So what's the message of the small and large olives in gaining a positive and productive self-image? Now, Adam and Moshe were both great men aware of their greatness. But in Adam, the sense of self-worth caused him to fall. Whereas in Moshe, the sense of his self-worth brought out humility and led to further greatness. True humility, as well as a truly positive self-image, does not come from denying or exaggerating our talents, but rather from acknowledging that all our abilities are present from God. And God has provided me these channels to accomplish his will in the best manner proper possible as in the only way that I can. So I, we need to know that each of us is completely unique. Nobody is like us, even two snowfalls are two snowfalls, two snowflakes are not alike. So when God is giving us qualities, he has a desire for our unique service that only each of us can do. So the lesson of the Aleph is realize your greatness, understand your infinite potential, 
your vast talents and your special capabilities. But at the same time, understand that these gifts are endowed to you by God, who desires that you utilize your unique talents to better the world in a way that you and only you can do. So experience your greatness, but at the same time, feel your smallness. That's it. Experience your greatness, but at the same time, feel your smallness. Humility, as well as a healthy sense of self, can come together. What it really means is that we need to bring God into the picture. Now, God is the one true Aleph. Remember, Aleph is the first letter of the Aleph Beit. We speak about the Aleph means God. And, and the Aluf Oshal Olam, he's the Aleph of the world, the only one. And we, each and every one of us, are part of the one God. Yet, God created us to be individuals, to represent God in multifacetedness in this world. Each of us is connected in God, but each of us has multifacetedness. When we stress our oneness in God, the true Aleph, this should lead to true humility. So instead of praising our wonderful qualities, we praise the one source of each of us and recognize that all the qualities come from God. So when we recognize our uniqueness, which is good, we can be grateful to the one who gives us these qualities and take the opportunities to use our gifts. And then we feel like a small Aleph, an emissary of God, that each of us is in the world to be an emissary of God and that God is giving us great gifts to be able to do that. Bringing the Aleph into the world is making a dwelling place for God into us and into the larger world. So in learning the commentaries about the word Vayikra, he called out, each time God called out to Moshe, he did it affectionately. We're talking about all the other times when God calls out to Moshe. And God was saying, Moshe, Moshe. And this was to prepare him for what God would teach him. This is fascinating to me. This is in Rashi. It says, when God wanted to cover several topics in the same communication, because we see that there are times that Hashem says, tell them to do this and then tell them this and then tell them this and tell them this. So there are a number of topics in certain communications. And then God paused in order to give Moshe time to absorb each topic between proceeding to the next. In other words, every time that God was going to go to another topic, there was a space, a pause. These pauses are indicated by the spaces between paragraphs in the written text of the Torah. So in Vayikra, it's saying in this very place, that we, we notice, like when you hold up a Torah scroll and you look at that Torah scroll, you could see that there are places where there's a lot of writing, even though the Torah scroll is a bit far if we're in the women's section to see what's written, but we could see that there are spaces between paragraphs. And the explanation comes in this place in the Rashi, because remember we said, this is where the children begin to learn in this place. So that would be a question that a normal child would also ask. Why is there a space between this paragraph and this paragraph, as we see? And the answer is because there is a pause. God says, tell this to the children, Moshe, Moshe. The children, then he goes on to speak. And after the subject is a pause, and what does that mean? That Moshe is taking in what he was taught. Now this teaches Moshe how to learn and how to teach. In other words, that Moshe and each of us, when we're learning, we need to pause and process. We need to be humble enough to know that learning takes time. I know sometimes Sina takes notes, people take notes, 
And what are the notes for? The notes are so that we could have the ability or listen to the class again to take in what was just said so that we could integrate it. Because hearing it is not enough. We have to pause and process. And we have to be humble enough to know that learning takes time. So we need to take the Torah that God is teaching us in a way that it could integrate into us and into our lives. Now, the result of this kind of learning is that we know that God is big and we're small. So we're all leaders, but we need to know the difference between the one big leader and the leader that we are always becoming through staying connected and doing the work to process and integrate, which can only succeed with humility. Interesting, the story that I was telling you before about the Tzemach Tzedek when he was a little boy and he was asking the Alter Rebbe about why there's a small Aleph, thinking back to that story, and it says the Alter Rebbe, who was the Alter Rebbe, he paused, closed his eyes, integrated the question, and then the answer came to him that he wanted to share. He didn't say, you're a little boy and I know the answer to this. He said, just a second, this question is coming to me. I need to take in the question and go deeply to get a true answer. And we have this ability, if the Alter Rebbe had this with this little boy who was his grandson, we have this with however we are leaders, with whom we are, we're leaders even in how we say hello to somebody in the supermarket. We're leaders, we're teaching them something. And true leaders care about those they lead. So when it says in the Torah, Hashem himself is saying that Moshe is the humblest man on the face of the earth. And the commentators explain that although Moshe was the most powerful leader in history, who took the Israelites out of bondage, who split the sea, received the tablets from God, Still, it didn't go to his head. We see why. Because he always considered his strengths and qualities as gifts from God. So this is what we're working with. The first word in Vayikra is telling us, this little Aleph, how we need to be. Yes, we're not supposed to think of ourselves as tiny. We have greatness. We have the big Aleph. But we need to know the source. So Moshe was simultaneously the greatest prophet and leader of his time. He had the big olive qualities and he was also the humblest man. And he was a role model to all future spiritual leaders. Now leaders wanna bring out the best in everyone. And this is best done in a loving way. If we could communicate and teach or do whatever we do in a loving way, that's even better. Now, when we hear these words, Vayikra, that Hashem, Vayikra El Moshe, that God is calling to Moshe, we hear a lot of love. And this is the unconditional love of God to Moshe, which is typical of a parent. Yes, Moshe was wonderful and talented and a faithful servant, but that wasn't why God loved him. Rashi, who picks up on this love, says, and points this out right away, why mention God calling to Moshe at all? Now, especially with love, why say that? Evidently, God would greet Moshe with Moshe, Moshe, and Moshe would answer, Hinani, here I am. And then God would begin his instructions. Now, <clears throat> in other words, God is giving affectionate words of endearment before getting down to business. Like the way we say to somebody, sweetie, I'm so happy that you're home, we might say to a child or to a dear friend, you know, honey, whatever we say, I'm so happy to be with you. So the honey or the sweetie is meant to say, before we talk about anything, I just want you to know that I love you. And Hashem is doing this. 
So the Alter Rebbe is also mentioning that he called out to Moshe. Now, any name that he would be using would limit God's expression of love. Because when he says, and when it says, and he called out, that is saying that it's, it's his essence calling out, that God himself is sending this love and connection from his essence, which means that this type of love is unconditional, like the love of a parent to a child. So when you're saying sweetie to your child, they come home, sweetie, I'm so happy to, say, to see you. That means before you hear what they did in school and before what happened and before what they tell you went on on the bus, that the sweetie is unconditional. And this love is not limited to the intimate relationship between God and Moshe, that the Alter Rebbe says, every one of our souls is imbued with a spark of Moses' soul. So we each have a spark of Moses' soul in us. And this loving communication between God and Moshe is the way that God relates to every one of us, regardless of our talents and accomplishments. Now, sometimes we ourselves look at ourselves and measure ourselves by, you know, we compare ourselves to other people and then we determine our self-worth. She's more this and she's more that. That leads us to become critics. And when we criticize ourselves, then we criticize everyone around us too. And you would think with that particular way of looking at things, we would think God is a critic and that he's looking at, at us based on what we accomplished in life. But God, do, even though God does appreciate our accomplishments and care about what we do or don't do, but his love for us is not related to what we have to show for ourselves. It's an essential love, adoring us for just being. God is proud of us just for being. How can we grow and teach our children to grow in ways that keep us humble and also to be given in acknowledgement and to, to acknowledge and use our talents and God-given qualities? How can we teach ourselves and our children? So there are writers, there's a book called Frames of Mind. There's a, an author, Dweck and Gardner, and they, two separate authors, and they tell us that we don't need to teach our children to have self-esteem. This is something that is a mistake that many people make. That way of educating them makes them afraid to fail. If they're told that they're smart or beautiful, you are so smart, you are so beautiful, they don't really believe it. And so they try to give that impression, but they're always afraid that they will fail. So then how do we do it? And we're talking about ourselves also. It's fine when we, we look beautiful or we feel that we look beautiful, that's good. But that doesn't mean that that's who we really are. We're happy to come out looking beautiful. But what, so then that asks us the question, what is the most empowering self image that a person could have or give to a child? And it is the knowledge that she is part of something much greater than herself. That is a healthy image. To tell her that she is a creation of God who has great expectations from her. And it's not the talents that she was born with that matter, but what she makes of them. In other words, it's her growing. Wow, instead of saying, you are so organized, you did such a good job. I see that what you did here, it looks so beautiful. And she thinks to herself, I can do that. I know how to do that. Not, I am always so organized because then when something is out of place, then you think, Oy vey, I'm not a mensch. I'm not a good person. But if you show the person that they are doing something good, that makes them want to grow. So the lesson of the Aleph that we get here is, Teach your child his greatness. Show him his infinite potential, his vast talents and his special abilities. But at the same time, clarify to your child that these are gifts endowed to him by God 
who desires that he utilize his unique talents to better the world in a way that he and only he can. So when a child is putting their blocks away and you say, oh, you did such a good job. Do you know there's a mitzvah that we're not supposed to leave something in the floor that somebody could fall over? Wow, you did that mitzvah and you did it in such a nice way. And they think, yes, I can do this. Not I am great, but I can do this. So in this, we're helping our child to experience her largeness, but at the same time, let her feel her smallness. Realizing her responsibility and the significance of her personal attainments will cause her to continually strive to reach even higher. So this is growth mentality. That is what Dweck and Gardner are talking about. Growth mentality, a mentality of wanting to grow, not thinking that you're static, but thinking that you're here to grow. Now, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs says that in Vayikra, he's telling us what it means to be called to a task in love because Vayikra means, <coughs> why is God calling out to Moshe? What it says right after that is V'yadaber Hashem a love. He's teaching to him what to do and how to do it. So being called Vayikra means you're being called in love. And this is a key area, Rabbi Sachs says, of Western thought. The concept of a vocation or a calling, I'm being called to do something. So that means that the choice of a career or a way of life is not just because you want to do it or because it offers other people benefits, but because you feel summoned to do it. You feel this is your meaning and mission in life. This is what you are placed on earth to do. So when somebody is taking a course, they're going to utilize it for the calling that Hashem is giving to them. So they're learning what they need to learn, but how are they going to use it? In the way that Hashem will call you to utilize it. So this means that when we're learning something, we need to feel that this is our mission and meaning in life. This is what we were placed on earth to do. So there are many such calls in Tanakh. Uh, Avraham heard, Avraham, Avraham, Hinani. He was called to leave his land and his family. Moshe was called at the burning bush. Isaiah was called when he saw in a mystical vision that God was enthroned and surrounded by angels. And then he heard the voice of the Lord saying, who shall I send and who will go with for us? And Isaiah answered, Hinani, I'm here, send me. And one of the most touching stories of this is of Shmuel, Samuel. His mother wanted to have a child who would serve Hashem. And she prayed to have a child and the child was Samuel. This is the story itself. We have spoken about this at Rosh Hashanah time. And he was dedicated by his mother to serve in the sanctuary at Shiloh, where the, where the Mishkan was. And there he acted as an assistant to Eli, the high priest. Now he was a young, he was a boy, a teenager, a young boy. And he, he was brought right away when he was three years old to, to and here to, to Eli. And in bed at night, he heard a voice calling his name. So Shmuel heard a voice, he assumed that it was Eli. And he ran to see what Eli wanted. But Eli told him, I didn't call you. And that happened a second time and a third time. And then Eli realized that it was God calling to the child. So he told Samuel, Shmuel, the next time the voice called his name, he should reply, speak, Lord, for your serv servant is listening. So this is obviously for all of us to say, speak, Lord, for your service is, servant is listening. It didn't occur to the child that it might be God summoning him to a mission, but it was. And that began his career as a prophet, a judge, and the anointer of Israel's first two kings, Shaul and David. 
Now, sometimes we ourselves, we see a wrong that needs to be righted, a sickness to be healed, a need to be met, and we feel it's speaking to us. And that's when we come as close as we can to hearing Vayikra, God's call. So sometimes we feel called upon. Sometimes it's as simple as, I have a friend who asked me to call her and I haven't called her yet. I need to call her. It feels like a calling. She needs something. Let me call her. It's a calling. Sometimes we feel something very simple. I can help another person with taking care of this. That is a call. We have to know what is our calling. And we have to hear God calling us. And sometimes it's by the Hashgacha Pratis that we feel that we can do it. And why does the word appear here at the beginning of the third and central book of the Torah, the third of five? Because the book of Vayikra is about sacrifices. And a vocation, our calling, is about sacrifices. We're willing to make sacrifices when we feel that they are part of the task that we are called on to do. So we're here because God wanted us to be here, because a, there is a task God wants us to perform. And it's up to us to look for our meaningful purpose in life. And there are things that only we can do. We who are what we do in this time, this place and these circumstances, based on who we are, what we can do. For each of us, God has a task work to perform, a kindness to show, a gift of love, love to share, loneliness to ease, pain to heal, or broken lives to help mend. And discovering this task, hearing Vayikra, God's call, is one of the great spiritual challenges for each of us. And how do we know what it is? Rabbi Sachs wrote, where what we want to do meets what needs to be done, where what we want to do needs what ne meets what needs to be done, that is where God wants us to be. So there are all kinds of offerings we can give to God. We can use our thoughts, our words, and our actions to make the world better. How do we feel connected to God in difficult times? Sometimes we don't even want to read the newspaper a lot because it's a difficult time and we can't solve what's going on in the whole world personally. So what do we do? We need to remember that God is calling to us even in moments when we don't know what to do. So God is bringing us opportunities to bring out offering, to bring our own offering and to come close. And we need to know that when we are doing a mitzvah, when we're learning Torah, when we're doing a kind deed, we are shining light out into the world and changing the world. So we have to trust that God is showing us how to bring light into the world. And that can happen through just being who we are because we have the inner light of our souls that are in us and shining out. We don't have to try to be something. We are this. We just have to know that God is calling us, calling on us to be ourselves and to do what we can do and to utilize it. And you never know. Sometimes you can walk down the street and say hello to somebody who has not had somebody say hello to him at all for quite some time. And when you say, and you don't have to say hello to everybody, but when you're called to do it, when you feel this person could use a hello, hello. And the other person could say, wow, she saw me. She saw me. And that can make a very big change in somebody's life because people need to be seen. And we, when our child comes home or a friend, we speak to a friend and we say, sweetie, or we say, I'm so happy to see you. What happens is 
that we are giving an offering to God because we are being who we are to do what we're here to do. Now, Vayikra comes just before Purim. Always. More or less, in our case, this because this is the nature of this week, it's going to be next week is Purim. But this Vayikra is a call to us. And what happens, we're all thinking about Purim. And at the time in P Persia, which was so difficult, there was a huge threat. And what the Jews did was they strengthened themselves with faith and prayers. And this is something we need to do, strengthen our faith and pray. Many people say to Hilim Psalms, we're praying to God to accomplish his purpose in the world in a beautiful way and to save us and bless us and take care of us so that we can be part of doing what God would like us to do. And what was the result? God answered them by turning the events upside down and saving them. And we need to know that they were praying. This, was, this situation went on for 11 months. So we have to understand that our offerings to God are one minute at a time, one hour at a time, one day at a time, one week at a time, going on and on. That we, it's not real to say, well, I already prayed, so I didn't get a result. But that we need to keep having faith and keep praying and keep doing what we're here to do. So at this, so what God did was when he turned the events upside down and saved them, he was responding to their prayers. He was responding to the people want to be close to me. And I, of course, want to be close to them. I'm going to take care of this. Of course, God intended that, but God needed us to offer ourselves. What does it mean offer ourselves in whatever we can do to connect to God? So in this time too, God is calling to us as a people, as individuals. And we can listen to the messages that come to us, either internally or from others. There are messages sometimes we feel an internal message. This is what I need to do. Somebody says, now is the time for me to make my house kosher. Yeah, it's kosher-ish, but now is the time for me to really make it kosher. Now is the time for me to, and we have to understand, and this is what Vayikra is telling us, God is calling out to us. And we could tune in to these messages. And sometimes God says it from somebody else. It would really be helpful if you would do this. And you think to yourself, I can do this for this person. And it makes a difference because maybe the other person can't do that for themselves and you can. So we can listen to the messages, the internal ones or from others, and we can tune into that signal and respond by stopping whatever it is that takes away from our responsiveness. Like for example, Sometimes we get so sidetracked by the phone or the phone or whatever it is that sidetracks us. And we have to know that what, in order to hear the signal, we have to take, stop what's taking away from our responsiveness. And we have to instead turn to what we know we are here to do. Like Samuel, Ellie said, the next time that you hear the call, say, I'm here to serve you. What can I do for you? In other words, respond, be here. Now, when we do this, and obviously this is work for all of us. And sometimes we need to write down what that call is so that we don't get sidetracked again but we need to make it part of what we are going to do. Now, when we hear the Aleph, when we hear the true Aleph, the one God calling to us, 
then we say, what can I do for you? Hinini, I'm here. And that brings the Aleph into the world. And we can answer in whatever way the offering is that we can give by doing a mitzvah, by learning Torah, by giving charity, tzedakah in a charity box in our own home, by lighting Shabbos candles on Friday before sunset, by helping another person, by responding with acts of goodness and kindness. So whatever we are doing that is meaningful and holy and giving to Hashem, this is a way that we answer. So we can hear the call, pay attention to the opportunity to respond and answer the call that God is making to us. So knowing that we are being called is wonderful because it makes us realize that God is here with us. We are not just things. We are specially made to do what we're here to do. And sometimes even when we don't know what is the thing that God wants us to do, that we need to pay attention. Stop getting sidetracked, pay attention, make that call. Go to that class, learn what we're here to learn. If it's a good class, share it with a friend that it might, who might want to learn also. And we do this with each other. We share a class that we like, we receive a class that, we, that a friend likes, and we integrate the call and the love that Hashem is giving us. And may we each and every one of us be blessed with all good and with doing what we're here to do and being who Hashem has made us to be and always hearing God's call with love and responding with true presence and whatever it is that we can do to serve Hashem with our own personal offering. <laughs>